A World Teach presentation. He says he's sorry. When two kids get in a fight in school, they end up in the principal's office. When one is the son of the mayor and it's an election year, it ends up on the news, mama. Well, he didn't start it, Sam. Even his teacher said so. A righteous man walks away from a fight, not into one. You taught me that, Mama. I said he was sorry. I didn't say he was right. Yeah. So punish him for two weeks. No TV, no friends over, and no telephone. I mean, unless, of course, it's school. Yeah. yeah. Two TV stations called while you were in there talking to him. I let the machine pick up. They said they'd call back. Hmm. And they will, too. Mm -hmm. Well, just tell them no comment. I can't do that. If you don't give the press something to print, they'll make it up. Make it up? They'll think I'm ducking this. And I don't need that. I'm behind in the polls already. Just three points. You just have to lose by one moment. Well, then tell them it's a family matter. And we will handle it in private. OK, and that he's being punished. That's important. Sam. Are you punishing him for what he did or to impress the voters? How much of what we do is purely for the good of others? Even when we try to do the right thing, if we do it because it makes us feel good, is it still a totally selfless act? What are the core motives behind what we do? The Seven Stages of Spiritual Growth With your guide, Dr. Bruce Wilkinson CORE, Part 1 Welcome to the Seven Stages of Spiritual Growth. You're a part of a large course that tries to answer the question, what are the predictable stages that a person can go through if they want to continue to grow deeper and to find a more fulfilling spiritual life. And I hope by now you're saying to yourself, boy, I am really growing now that I understand how the spiritual life actually works. And you recognize the milestones that you're in, in conversion and in consecration, conduct, communion, character, and now we're in core. And as that word represents, we're at the very heart of things, the deep part of your life. I want to kind of sneak up on this topic with you and share a story that you've probably heard about, but maybe you've missed this sentence. It's a story about a man named Gideon who led the Israelites against an enemy that was far larger and stronger than they. And then God interrupted what was going on and said something to Gideon. And the Lord said to Gideon in Judges chapter 7, verse 2, the people who are with you, Gideon, are too many. And I'm sure at that moment Gideon was thinking, Lord, there's probably six or seven to one. What do you mean there's too many? But then the Lord continued and said, the people who are with you are too many for me. For me, Lord? What, what are you talking about? They're not on, you're up there and I'm down here. They're too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands lest Israel claim the glory for itself against me, said God, against me, saying something. That is, my own hand has saved me. Glory, therefore, is extremely important to God. And in this moment, God said, if I let these people have this many on their forces and fight against an army far greater and they win, they're going to claim the glory for them as if they fully achieved it without my involvement in their life. Now, if I'd have come around and I've said something to a person in that war, one of Gideon's fighters, did you work? Did you fight the best that you could? Was it dangerous? Could you have lost? The answer would have been yes. It was very difficult. And yes, we did win. I wonder how many of those would have thought that God was involved in that, in that battle in any, any particular way. When I read that, it really shocked me. 
that God said, something can happen and you will take glory for yourself against me. That I should have gotten this glory, but you took it from me. And therefore, I'm taking this away so that you realize when it happens, you couldn't have done it. Therefore, you will have to give me the glory. When's the last time you gave glory to God? I mean, you consciously gave credit to God. You extolled what he did. You praised what he did. And you knew down deep inside of your heart that God himself had done that even though you were involved in it. Well, that's what we're going to deal with. Something very deep inside of you and inside of me. And you're going to see some things that are disturbing about yourself. I know I found myself disturbed when I learned these because they're so hidden from us. And I find only those people who have really grown in the Lord ever get to what we're going to be talking about. We know about giving God glory, but we really don't know about giving God glory. This is the core. And in your workbook, we want to deal with the meaning of the core. What does it mean, core? Secondly, the misconceptions about our core. And third, the mindset about the core or the heart of our own being. And in the next session, we're going to draw up a line across this floor and let you see where you are in these five milestones of that which is way down deep inside of your own life and your own heart. What is the meaning of the word core? Well, the word core means the remaining central portion of something. It's when everything else has been cut off and all that remains is the heart. And that's what we're going to talk about. Not your actions, not your character, not your thoughts even, something that goes way down like a taproot right into the middle of the dark part of you that you and I can't see. It's not that it's dark, it's just out of our sight. And only rarely does a Lord or a situation come along and we can actually see it. In your notes, letter A, core motives are our underlying and inner drives. Everything that I do and everything that you do, do you do it because you have a motive to do it. A motive is something deep inside of you and me. We don't see motive. We see what a motive made us do. And if our motive can't be fulfilled, we feel very, very frustrated. And if it's a deep motive in us, we'll rearrange everything to make sure that motive gets fulfilled and it's happy and it's calm. Core motives then ultimately determine everything that you do. You do it because there was a reason, and that reason was the motive. And secondly, since that's true, core motives also determine what we become. We become what we're motivated to become. If a person, for instance, wants to win that gold medal we spoke about in the series earlier in the Olympics, that is their motive. That is their desire to have the gold medal. But there's something even deeper than that. Why? Motives answer the question, why do you want this? Why drives what we become? Motives are frequently hidden from our awareness. If I were to ask you, why did you come today? Because I just wanted to be here. Why? Well, I thought I would enjoy myself. Yeah, but why? And you kept asking the why question, which can be a bit frustrating. You'll eventually find yourself way down to, there's a motive why you came. And motives are hidden. I remember bumping into a bad motive. I was speaking years ago, 20 years ago now, in, a, in a Oregon, and in a service on a Sunday morning. And I preached one of my favorite sermons. And um, I thought it went pretty good. You know, you don't say that. You just... <laughs> but I said to myself, this was okay, especially when I was in my 20s. So I get, came down, and people were saying comments, and it was ended. It was one lady off to the side, standing there in the shadows, and she wanted to talk to me. So she finally came up, and she was about this high, and she looked right me in the eye. She said, young man, that was a very good sermon. Thank you. I heard all kinds of new ideas. Thank you. But I didn't hear much of God's word, and that's why I came. And then she turned and walked away. I tell you. Oh, 
And I remember being stunned with the truth. That was the truth. And I didn't know that back then. And for years, I was uh, perplexed about why. Uh, why was that true? Not was it true, it was true. I wanted to know why was it true. And one day, I stumbled on this passage, and I started and underlined it. It says this. Jesus is speaking. He says, He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. Oh, my, what a tough thing that was. The realization that my motive, hidden to me at that moment, it's not hidden anymore, was I wanted glory from my ideas. Somebody come up and say, your ideas were pretty good. I thought those thoughts, thank you. And as I have become deeply involved in this subject over the years, I must admit to you, I did not like what I found in me at all. I think I began to see a light of uh, spotlight coming from heaven, you know, where God was center stage. And as I meditated on this, I thought to myself, I'm like that little boy who comes from off stage and puts his toe in the light. Just so a little bit can show. And then it kind of goes like this, you know. <laughs> and then pretty soon you're, you're, you're in the light. And then you're in the center of the light. Wow. You ever felt that way? We don't want to think about that. <laughs> the Lord says... I want the glory, and I want you to give me glory. In fact, he made us for his glory. So the question you'd want to ask is, how much glory do you give to God? How much light does he get from what you did? And how much light do you take away from what he has done and is doing? Glory. I want to give you some misconceptions about glory as I've meditated on this. Number one, the core motive won't be judged by God in the present or in the future. That what we, why we do things is not going to be judged now if I have a bad motive, and it certainly won't be judged later. Well, just look at this for a moment. There's a very amazing story that happens in the book of Acts with a man named Herod. And here's what it says in Acts 12, 21. So on a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to them. And the people kept shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. It must have been an incredible, an incredible oration for the people to say, not a voice of a, of a man, but God. Then immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and he died. There was a moment, wasn't there, that a man was judged because he took the glory and accepted it. That's not a voice of a man, that's a voice of a God. Probably. You may be right. I wouldn't admit that, but... And God judged him. Has God ever judged you for your motives? He certainly has, and he certainly has judged me as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, there's another illustration about the fact that these will be judged in the future. And it says this, For Paul said, I know nothing against myself, yet I'm not justified by this. But he who judges me is the Lord. Now listen to this verse. Therefore, judge nothing before the time, until, what's the time? Until the Lord comes. This means after you're dead or unless you're alive when he comes, until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal, here it is, the counsels of the heart. Why did you do what you did? And then, the Bible says, each one's praise will come from God. Each one's praise will come from God. Point number two. The misconception is that core motives are innately pure and God-honoring. That my motives, that I'm actually born with the motive to honor God and give glory to God. 
and that only society messes up or ruins my motive. That's a misconception. After the fall of Adam and Eve, our motives have been tainted. And from that point on, our motives are for ourselves. Your, you, your motives are for yourselves and mine are for myself. And surprisingly, even some of the things we think are the purest, they may not turn to be so pure. Not, not, all of us struggle with this. Probably one of the issues in the Old Testament that has been most difficult for years for me is what happened with Moses when he was doing all the things that God wanted him to do and then he made one mistake, it seemed like to me, as a younger man and God said you can't go in the promised land. And it always seemed severe to me until I understood it, listened to it. Remember God said to speak to the rock and then water will come out of the rock and this is what took place. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. Now watch these words. Here now, you rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? Can Moses bring a drop of water out of that rock? Must we bring water out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand, <laughs> dramatically, I'm sure, and struck the rock twice. Why? Dramatic. Where did he get in this? He got that he was involved in this. And water came out abundantly, and the congregation or animals drank. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and said, Because you didn't believe me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, you didn't hallow me. You didn't honor me before. God said, at that point, you can't go in the promised land. It's powerful, isn't it? This issue of our motives being pure is not true. Your motives, from the day you were born, are not to give God glory. Point number three, core motives are out of my control. People believe, well, my motives, I can't change my motives when you can. They're fully in my control. And I can use them improperly or use them properly and change them and repent of them, and so can you. Now let's get to the mindset of core. How should you think about core motives in your own life? Number one, if you were to chase all through Scripture what core motives are, and all these motives are here and you keep going down further and further and further and further until you can't get any further down, they're called self-glorification, the desire for glory this way. It goes all the way back to Satan. The Bible says he corrupted his wisdom for the sake of his splendor. He wanted glory. And if you follow all the way to the end of the, all of the New Testament, you find that Satan had one primary goal besides trying to over, overthrow the Lord. It was to get people to worship him. And at the end it says, and the whole world worshiped Satan. The desire for self-glory is a desire that started with Satan and now has infected all of us. Number two, what do these core motives do to us? What do they make us do? They make us hunt for something. B, core motives means to live for honor, for praise, and for admiration. How do you get glory to yourself? Well, somebody outside of you can say something to you or you can do something for society, a building, an artwork. And people look at that and say, wow. I think for most of us, we get our self-glorification from ourselves. We do something and we think to ourselves, that was pretty nice. That's <laughs> getting out a mirror and flashing God's glory to us. I think I'm all right. Self-glorification. We hide it, but Bible teaches that that is something that is extremely important. Now, how do, how do we see this coming out of ourselves when we live and when we act? Well, number three, core motives are displayed by our attitudes and our actions. When you see a person compromising it's for self-glory somehow or another. 
this is right, I know it's right, but... And if you follow their activity all the way to the end, it always ends up in the same place. This issue of compromise. So many times when you find that people in the marketplace have conflict, it's one person is protecting their turf, wanting it their way, and there's conflict between them and another person because they don't want them to get the credit, get the honor, get the power, which brings glory back to us. Number three, self-glorification can come from um, or show up as control, where you try to over-control your children so that they won't ever do anything or say anything or become something that will bring embarrassment back on you. Is that your child? Whoo! So you over-control. Number four, self-glorification causes drivenness inside, churning. In the marketplace, that's all over the place. Churning. Why? To achieve. Why? To get ahead. Why? It's this. Self-glorification. Would the person be churning if the person's goal was to glorify God? There'd be no churning. There'd be a sense of calmness and peace. And Phil, self-glorification causes a sense of callousness to other people. Because as long as that root is there in us, in you, or in me, it causes us to be callous against the needs of other people because we're seeking what we want. I want you to back away and ask a very deep question. What's the justification that we have? How can we say to ourselves, we deserve the glory? Because if there's not justification, we can't get that motive met. Core motives are justified by personal qualities that we have and by achievements. Number one, self-glorification is justified by our appearance. If you are a beautiful person or a handsome person, you will get notice, you will get comment. Number two, self-glorification is justified by our abilities. If you are really good at something, then that justifies the credit that you receive because of what you can do. Number three, self-glorification is justified by our authority. Sometimes you can see this in the marketplace. You can see this in church where a person who has a position of authority will get the not only respect but more admiration and the person will receive it then as a validation for the self-glorification. Well, I have this role or this position. Number four, self-glorification is justified by our accumulations, what we have, the car we drive, the house we live in, the clothes that we wear. You must be really important. You drive this car. You wear this watch. It's what we've accumulated so far and lastly, self-glorification is justified by our accomplishments. It is, what have we done? Oh, look, you did that? You built that? You painted that? You made that? Wow! Now, all those things aren't wrong. It's not wrong to be thanked and appreciated for what you've done. But the issue isn't, was it right or wrong that the, that the Israelites defeated the Midianites? It wasn't wrong. They were supposed to. And were they supposed to give it their all? Yes. Well, then how did God look at that and say, you will claim the glory for yourself against me? What was happening in how God viewed that? That in the midst of all of that, they would not find it to be true that they would give God any glory for that because they did not see that God was involved because they were the ones doing the work. Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, it's a very interesting point. Think about those issues I just read to you. Which one do you take glory from? Your appearance, your ability, your authority, the accumulation that you have, or the accomplishments that you've been able to do? Because something in there is the basis for your self-glorification. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, it says this, For who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did not receive it, why do you glory 
as if you had not received it. What am I saying here? That every single thing on the list that we justify as the valid reason for taking any of God's glory, our appearance, I made you that way, our ability, I gave you those gifts, the ability to make money, I gave you that as well. Then no matter what you think of, God has given it. We take that which God has given it and we twist it many times without even knowing it and use it to get credit and honor toward ourselves. Now when you think about this, what would happen if that, if that um, motive wasn't there in your life? What would happen if that motive just was gone and you had a different motive and your motive was exactly the opposite? That is, you lived to bring glory and credit and honor to God. You see, when you study heaven and you read what the angels and what the elders and what we will say in heaven, we will say all glory to God. Why do they say all glory to God? They say all glory to God because at that instant, you see, everything that we took credit for here was done by him. And therefore, there is no basis to take the glory there. And the people can't get it out of their mouth quick enough. Glory to you, glory to you, glory to you. Why? Because they took the glory. And so the issue that we're dealing with is something very, very challenging to grab a hold of. That every single thing that you have, every single thing that you may be proud of or feel good about, is given by God for a reason. He gave it to you, but he, he gave it to you for a purpose. That this spotlight that now shines on me, he didn't give it for that. He, in a sense, said, will you please move out of the spotlight? And will you please tell everyone else that I did that? So that people all over the world will say, oh, what a wonderful, incredible God who has done all of this. The heavens declare the glory of God. The Bible says, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all for the glory of God. You see the purpose? For the glory of God.